Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to the um, probabilistic machine learning reading group. Um, tonight, we will be starting uh, the third section of the book on neural networks and deep learning. And we have um, Dr. Amita Kapoor, who will be presenting the material. So Amita, if you want to share your screen and get started, that would be great. Uh, OK, so I'm just starting up with my screen. And I think so it should be visible. OK, just give me a moment, please. I don't know why it every time forgets to. Ganesh. Uh, I, I will be just uh, quitting and uh, joining back again. Just give me a moment, please. Okay. I guess it works now. Uh, is it visible? Yes, your screen is visible now. That's... Okay, fine, good, thanks, yeah. Uh, okay, so should I start? Yes, please uh, Please go ahead and start. Okay, fine. Thanks, Piri, for organizing it, and welcome to everyone. Uh, it's a big chapter, so I will try to be slightly fast because I would like to complete it within an hour, but uh, still all the questions are welcome and in the case we cannot handle the questions right now, you can always email to me and we can have a discussion. Okay, so we okay. are starting um, up. Also, just so you know, we, we do actually have an hour and a half um, of Zoom time, so don't feel... Uh, okay. Okay. No, that's okay. It's my mainly it's more because I start feeling very sleepy starting 10 a.m. This is 10 okay. 30 p.m. at my end. So it's more okay. for yeah. It's more for you. Okay, right. no problem. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so let's start. Okay, so uh we will start up with the things that we are going to, uh, we have already covered actually. So uh, in the previous chapters, we have gone through the logistic regression, the linear regression and even the generalized linear models. Now, what was common in all these models is that these models made a very strong assumption that the input and the output mapping is linear. But we know that that is not always true. So there was a way, there is a way out of it, and that is using feature transformation. That is, we replace x, our input, by some transformation applied to it, that is phi x. And what we then try to do is we find to find a function approximation, which is mapping this transformed x using some particular weights and the bias. So here the weights and bias still remain linear, but now the input and output mapping can be non-linear. And here, uh, basically, we have both theta 1 and theta 2 as our learning parameters. Means I can generalize this transformation instead of doing it by hand, we can have a system which can learn it. So this is the basic idea behind neural networks. And this is the basic idea which we are going to extend to deep neural networks. Let us see how. Now, if we repeat this process recursively, what we can do is, that is, I apply this transformation once, then I apply it again, and then apply it again. Then what we can do is we can have, we can create more complex functions. All right, so this is the representation, as you can see out here. This is the representation that we can have where many of the functions are applied, where each F subscript L corresponds to the function at particular layer L. So they can be very different functions or they can be similar functions and so on. And we can have a very more complex, uh, you know, uh, relationship being mapped using deep neural networks. So this is the key idea behind deep neural networks. Now, this sort of a network can be represented as a directed acyclic graph. And the examples that we'll be going to do in this particular chapter will be restricted to feed forward neural networks, which are also known as multi-layered perceptrons. In the next chapters, you'll be doing more uh, complex uh, uh, directed acyclic graphs or more complex deep neural networks, but this particular chapter is restricted to the multi-layered perceptron. 
All right. And another thing that we are going to be working on in this particular chapter is we will be focusing on structured data. So what we mean by structured data, data is that it is a tabular data. It is a data with fixed dimensions. So I'm not having images of different sizes or you know something like that. The data has fixed dimensions. So I can represent it in a particular matrix in a very structured format. And each of the column of that matrix can be corresponding to a specific meaning, like for example, height, weight, age, cost, and so on. All right. So we will be basically focusing on multilayer perceptron and we'll be focusing on the structured data. So with this basic introduction, we start with the multilayer perceptron chapter. And in this particular section, what we are going to focus or what we are going to cover will be the artificial neural networks, the first perceptrons, how we can stack them to get a multilayer perceptron, and why we require a differentiable activation function, and finally, how all this is. Um, Amita, we can't um, hear you anymore. Hello? Yes, now we can hear you. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, fine, thanks. Okay, so uh, should I stay, start, stay with this uh, slide or? Uh, should I move, uh, go a little bit behind? Um, is this I I think slide you okay with, with it? I think this slide is okay. Okay, so I am going to start up with the multi-led perceptrons because before that it was anyways introduction. So I hope uh, uh, it will be okay now. So uh, what we want to do in this particular case is uh, we are starting up with the perceptron. Now, when we talk about perceptron, the perceptrons can be considered as deterministic version of logistic regression. So uh, you can see in this particular expression out here that my perceptron is basically uh, nothing but uh, uh, you can see a heavy side function applied to the weighted sum of inputs with the bias, all right? So uh, this particular, uh, where h is the heavy side function or also called as a linear threshold function. And uh, what we have found about with the perceptron is that it can solve only linear problems. So that means if I have a problem where, I, for example, if I'm taking a classification problem, I can solve the problem only if there are two classes into it, only then it can solve it. Otherwise it cannot solve it, right? So it, it can find out a decision boundary which linearly separates the, let us say here, the circles with the triangles. But if they can, there is no linear line, then my perceptron cannot solve it. And a very detailed uh, description of what all has, what all perceptron can do and cannot do was done by um, Marvin Miski and Papert in this book, particular book called as Perceptron. All right, so they kind of told that it cannot solve non separable problems, plus its uh, training time is increasing exponentially with time. 
So one of the problems, as you can see out here, was how to solve XOR problem, which is a very, which is a nonlinear problem, but a very common problem other way around. So if I try and see this particular problem in uh, this thing, so this is my truth table for XOR. Uh, I have uh, the inputs and the x1 and x2 are the inputs and y is the output. So what happens here is if both the inputs are zero, the output is one. If both the inputs are one, the output is again zero. So if the both the inputs are zero, output is zero. And if both the inputs are one, output is zero. Otherwise, the output is one. So if I try and see this particular, uh, plot this up, you can see that it is basically a nonlinear separable problems. The ones cannot be uh, separated with the zeros. All right. So I have uh, basically uh, the ones and the zeros, which cannot be separated out here. So we cannot solve this particular problem using a single layer of perceptron. But as shown in this particular uh, diagram, and as we will just see, we can solve it using more than one perceptron. All right. So for example, I can have an O-ring say a network, I can have an ending network and I can have an end or not a network and then we can have the final uh, exoring taking place. So let us see how this works. So this particular way of stacking multiple layers is what multilayer perceptron is all about. So let us see one example of how it is being done. So uh, you can see this is one uh, handcrafted example which can solve exor problem. This particular uh, model has three perceptrons uh, labeled as H1, H2, and Y. And these are the weights which are specified to it. All right. So uh, H1 and H2 are called as the hidden units. And uh, then we have my H1, which is basically having the weights all set to one for inputs and a bias of my one set to minus 1.5. So uh, this is performing uh, the operation of uh, anding and uh, H2 is performing the operation of oring. So with this particular thing, if you see, uh, if I take up my H1 and I uh, substitute the values of weights and the bias, this is what we get as a relationship for H1, this is what its output is going to be. So you can see that if X1 and X2 both are one, only then the H1 will be greater than, means this, this quantity will be X1 plus X2 minus 1.5 will be greater than one. And as a result, only then will we have our neuron that is H1 fire, otherwise it will not fire. All right. And similarly, H2 is uh, uh, doing odd. That means only when both of them will be zero, it will not fire. Otherwise, it will fire. And then if I just combine them again, this is what I'm going to get Y, which is uh, not of H1 and uh, ending with uh, H2. So this is going to give us the XOR uh, relationship. All right. So you can see that it is not that perceptron cannot solve the XOR problem, perceptron can solve the XOR problem. The only thing is we need more than one perceptron. But now the problem is here the weights were basically fixed. All right. And uh, we needed a mechanism of how to learn these particular weights. And then, and therefore we, uh, and uh, just to add it up, uh, probably I think it, it is mentioned somewhere in the book also that this particular idea of, you know, solving it with fixed weights was something which was given quite uh, late uh, by uh, McClodge and Pitts. Uh, these symbols are anding and uh, or symbols. So if you have uh, inverted V symbol, that is and symbol and otherwise V symbol is or symbol. Okay. So this particular uh, thing of uh, implementing it using uh, fixed weights was given by McClotch and Pitts in 1946. All right. So you can see that this particular structure is quite old in that particular perspective. But the problem is here weights are fixed. So we can solve a problem, but the weights remain fixed. And there is no way of learning it. So the question was how we can make the network learn. So this particular idea of making the networks learn is where differentiable MLP comes into picture. So what we do out here is instead of the heavy side function, which was giving an output one, in the case, the uh, quantity Wx uh, weight into weighted sum of inputs plus the bias is greater than one and output is one. Otherwise, it is zero. 
this is a non-differentiable function because it is discontinuous. So if I can replace this function with a differentiable activation function, then it is possible for us to learn weights. And the whole, this chapter deals up with how we can do that training, what are the different issues that come into training and how we can resolve that particular training. So uh, what happens in this case is uh, output of any hidden layer now is replaced uh, as a function where uh, phi, where phi is a linear function. All right. So this phi is a linear activation function. And it's just a mistake that here the phi and this phi is different. It's just typographical mistake. Both are same uh, phi. All right. Okay. So uh, in the case I talk about the layer, then it is ZL as a function of phi L. And in the case, I want to talk about individual units in each layer, then the output can be represented as ZKL. So ZKL will represent the kth neuron in the Lth layer. All right, so the, the BKL will be the bias of the kth neuron at uh, Lth layer. And then similarly, the weights and the corresponding inputs. Okay, so, uh, Here, this quantity BL plus weight into ZL minus one is called as pre-activations, all right? And in many books, you will also find it to be called as activity AL, all right? And that, that is how the book is also writing it as AL, but it is calling it pre-activations. And we can then say basically that my ZL is phi L into AL. So now my phi L is differentiable and therefore I can calculate its gradient using a chain rule and we can apply the most popular back propagation algorithm to learn weights, all right? So the first and foremost important thing is that we are, our activation function needs to be differentiable. Now with this thing said, there are various options of activation functions that are there because there exists a large number of activation functions which are differentiable. So let us just go through some of them the most popular ones of them. So the first one that we consider is the linear activation function. Now, if this linear activation function for a single layer will be as good as simple, some constant CL, which is of that particular layer into the activation activity, right? So it is CL into A. And in the case I have multiple layers, then it is WL into CL and so on, so on, so on, each way it's multiplying. And eventually it is basically just, uh, you know, multiplication of all weights multiplied into inputs. All right. So if I have linear, it is basically some uh, different constant multiplied by input. It remains linear as long as all the activation functions, all layers have the same linear activation function. Okay. The option is, so as you can see out here that since it remains linear, it will not solve my problem of, you know, solving nonlinear uh, problems. So what we think of is, we take up uh, activation functions which are not linear activation functions. So example of one non-linear activation function is sigmoid activation function. Again, the reason sigmoid was used is because if you can see, this is the sigmoid activation function plot, and you can see that it is basically a very smooth approximation to the heaviside function. Heaviside function would have started from zero, uh, stayed to the zero line, and then it would have just done us, you know, uh, switch to one at uh, x equal to zero. So it is a very smooth uh, approximation of every side function and therefore uh, historically sigmoid activation function was very much used in the earlier neural networks. And this is the mathematical expression for the sigmoid activation function. And we can see that this is a differentiable activation function. Now let us see some other activation functions, which are again very much into use. So one activation function that is, is used is the tan hyperbolic activation function given by this representation. And then we also have a very popular rectified linear unit activation function, also called as a value activation function. So this value activation function, if you see, is basically zero. In the case, my input, my activity or my pre-activations are less than zero. Otherwise, it is, uh, you know, linearly increasing. So it is basically linear for all activity, which is greater than zero, but otherwise it is zero. All right. And since what we are concerned of with the differentiations, I just thought it would be good to present it here once. And we will be repeating this part that how each of these, uh, you know, uh, activations 
the uh, uh, activation functions vary and how their derivatives vary. Because when we talk about backpropagation, what we'll be using will be their derivative. So if I come to the sigmoid activation function, the blue line represents the sigmoid curve, all right? But as we have seen that my sigmoid gets saturated for very large inputs to plus one and for very large negative inputs to zero, as a result, its derivative becomes zero at these two ends. All right, so that means if I'm talking about the derivative and if my derivative is going to go into the back propagation, I will have maximum uh, uh, variation or maximum possibility of change or a weight update only when it is in non-zero, the derivative is non-zero. That means when, it, uh, when the sigmoidal activation function uh, is saturating, I will not get uh, weight updates. Similarly, if I talk about the tan hyperbolic, the shape of tan hyperbolic is similar to that of sigmoid activation function. The only thing is for negative, it saturates to minus one instead of zero. And as a result, the shape of the derivative of tan hyperbolic is also exactly the same, but there is a very significant difference. You can see that the maxima of the derivative of sigmoid is hardly 0.2 something, 0.25, I guess, if I remember correctly. But here it is significantly higher. As you can see, the, derivat the uh, derivative of tan hyperbolic, the peak of the derivative of tan hyperbolic is significantly higher. And then let us see the 10 uh, ReLU activation function. So here you can see that while uh, the ReLU activation function also become, gets a zero derivative when my activity is less than zero, but for otherwise, uh, for linear increase or for positive uh, pre-activations, it gives me a constant value. That means there is always some contribution to the derivative, all right? And therefore, uh, we can see that uh, the activation functions, which are going to give us a gradient and non-zero gradient, they are better because in that case, the gradient signal from higher layers will propagate to the earlier layers. Otherwise, it will not propagate. All right, and this is uh, basically what results in the vanishing gradient problem, which we'll be again discussing in uh, details uh, in the coming sections. Okay, so now, uh, okay, so this is basically that value is non-saturating. As you can see, it is basically non-saturating in one end. It is saturating at one end, right? Because it lies between zero to infinity. So its minimum value is zero, but it is non-saturating at one end. So it, uh, gradient does not vanishes if I move beyond zero or my activity is positive. So now let us see some of the applications of multilayered perceptron where they have been used. So this is one example from a neural network playground, uh, again taken from the book itself. So here, if we have a 2D data and we want to classify into two categories, the easier way is to uh, build a, a, a multi-layered perceptron in this form. So here I have two inputs. Then the first hidden layer, I have four neurons and then I have output with two neurons. All right. And so uh, I can uh, correspondingly write down my uh, training parameters. So I have my Z1, which takes the inputs and then Z2, which takes the output of Z1. And then finally, the uh, output A3 is uh, obtained from Z3 using the activations, right? So I have inputs and then the final output. So there are basically weights coming here uh, into the picture W1, W2, and W3. So the output here, this output that you're seeing is the uh, categories in which it is basically divided. So all these becomes part of the training parameters and we can minimize the negative log likelihood, something which we discuss in chapter four, and we can fit the training data even when the data is highly nonlinear. All right, so this is one uh, example which you can see out here, the data is nonlinear, the orange and blue curves, but still it is able to resolve it and do it. So this is the beauty of this particular uh, system. All right. Means neural networks, when we use a nonlinear activation function, we can use it to solve nonlinear problems. Now, uh, another application that you can see out here is the image classification. So uh, for the image classification, if we are using a multilayer perceptron, first thing that we will need to do is to convert it from 2D to 1D, or if you have a 3D image, then from 3D to 1D, and then you add the multilayered layers. So this is one example of how the layers are there. 
So this is an example of considering MNIST data set. So the MNIST data set has 28 cross 28 size input images. So that makes it 784. Therefore, the flattened layer shape is 784. Then uh, this is the input to the first tense layer. So the, so the number of training parameters, the number of weights will be 784. That is the input numbers into 128. That is the number of neurons in this tense layer plus the bias term, which will be equal to the number of neurons in this tense layer, that is 128. So this comes out to be 100480 term. Then if you come to the next layer, then 128 uh, output of this first dense layer goes to dense one. And then this dense layer has again 128. So I can calculate the number of neurons as 16512. And similarly, in the end, 128 into 10 plus 10. Right. So this this gives me a total number of training parameters, adding all of them, 118282. So this is a large network, but large in the sense of the numbers, not compared to the recent ones, which have even many, many much more uh, trainable parameters. OK, similarly, I can use it for text classification. And when I'm using it for the text classification, uh, the convention is to use a bag of words. So what we do out here is we, uh, let us say if I have a, a bag of words is basically uh, collecting all the unique words which are there in your text document. So that makes you a bag of words. And the total number of these words becomes the vocabulary size. And each word is represented as a one hot encoded vector. So if I have only 10 words in my uh, uh, you know, document, then I will call it bag of words will have my vocabulary of size 10. And each of these words will be represented by a vector of size 10. Similarly, if I have a vocabulary of 1000, it will increase, uh, the vector will become 1000 dimensions. Each vector will have 1000 dimensions and so on. All right. But as again, you can see that since it is one hot encoded, it is a sparse vector. And as a result, the, uh, the, doc the matrix that I will get for each of the document or each of the text will be a sparse matrix. All right. So uh, from this sparse matrix, we require a dense matrix so that we can, uh, you know, efficiently use it. So what we do is we create an embedding which converts this V-dimensional sparse, sparse matrix to E-dimensional dense matrix. And there, uh, it has some trainable parameters defined as weights W1. And then uh, this is again something which is which can be done and which may not be required, but it is again conventionally done. You can have a uh, pooling out here so that it is converted to a fixed sized vector using some sort of an average pooling. All right, but there is no trainable parameter here. It is just you know averaging out the output of the embedding layer, and then you add your multilayer perceptron layer, so the dense layers. So this is one of the examples of the model built in this particular case. So here again, if I start with the vocabulary of 1000 and uh, I have an amending of 16, so the trainable parameters become 16 into 1000 that you can see out here. Sorry, the uh, vocabulary was not 1000, the vocabulary was 10,000. So accordingly, it will be 16 into 10,000. And then I have the global averaging, which will not increase any number, right? So it will remain as it is. And then uh, the first dense layer will take 16 from the global averaging. And then uh, again, 16 from here, uh, this the dense layer. And then the six, this 16 has another 16 bias. So this becomes 272. And then finally, the uh, last layer, that is the last dense layer will have uh, 16 from its first layer. And then dense one layer has only one output unit. So Correspondingly, the result is 17. All right. So this is how the uh, MLP can be used. And this you can see that how the structure is basically defined. We can also use it for uh, basically heteroscodastic uh, regression. That is basically uh, predicting the variance of my input. Right. So uh, means like trying to find out the input dependence. So in this case, what we need to do is if uh, we are given a particular input, we want to compute its mean and some sort of a variance of that particular uh, signal. So I have a function which is going to uh, estimate the mean and there is a function which is for the sigma. So in this case, 
what we do is we can have a shared backbone as we can see here the pink one that is a shared neural network multi-led perceptron and then we have separate heads one going for estimating sigma and the other one going for estimating mu all right so this is what we can again do so uh, this is one example again of mlp applications all right so uh, discovers the MLP applications. Now what we start up with is the importance of the depth. So now, uh, by now we have understood that we can have multiple layers of, uh, you know, uh, perceptron. And as we add the multi-perceptron multi layers, uh, we are able to handle the complex, that is non-linear problems. Now, uh, it has been proved that a multi-layered perceptron with even a single hidden layer is a universal function approximator. What it means is that if even if I have a single hidden layer, it should be able to solve or satisfy or converge to solve any function, any nonlinear function or linear function, right? That means a single hidden layer should be sufficient to, uh, you know, um, model or solve any problem which we can solve using deep neural networks. However, experimentally, as well as theoretically, it has been proved that the deeper the network is, the better, better is its performance. And the reason for that is because the features that are learned by the earlier layers, they are uh, leveraged by the uh, higher layers in some sort of a hierarchical way. All right. And as a result, we get better results from the deeper layers. All right. So uh, one thing is like now we can see that if I have a deeper network, it will give me better results. But at the same time, the more deeper I go, the problem of vanishing gradient will become more and more pronounced. Now, this is something which uh, is there, like as we discussed, uh, perceptron was first proposed in 1962. The McLaughlin fish model, which can solve exor, was given in 1946, and still. Uh, the deep learning happened only in 2010 with basically starting up with automatic speech recognition and then finally CNN where it won the ImageNet classification. And the reason for uh, this is basically uh, threefold, I would say. One is definitely the present uh, availability of res uh, hardware resources which can do the task like GPUs and TPUs. And then the data which is now available to all of us through Kaggle, through other places, means there is internet, we all have mobiles capturing images every day. So a large amount of data is available. And then there are large number of open source libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and MXNet, which one can use to you know, implement these um, models and make them learn. And uh, finally, let us see how this whole thing is connected with the biology. As we always say that uh, neural networks are inspired from biology. So that is basically because if you see on the left hand side, that is the uh, diagram of a biological neuron. So in the biological neuron, we have dendrites, which takes the input from other neurons. Then there is a nucleus which processes this particular, uh, this is a soma body with a nucleus and in this soma and the nucleus, the information that has been taken from uh, other neurons is processed and then this processed information via exon goes to other uh, neurons. All right, so this is how a biological neuron works. A artificial neuron is here presented on the uh, right side and this is basically the model which was given by McClatch and Pitts and uh, in this particular case you can see that I start up with the input so this is x1, x2 and x3 my inputs then these inputs are applied some weights which is analogous to how dendrites are processing dendrites apply some weights to each of the inputs that they are taking from different other neurons it reaches my uh, soma or sigma system here where it becomes the pre-activation, all right, where it is basically nothing but weighted sum of all the inputs. And then this goes to the activation function, that is some uh, processing takes place, which is the nucleus does here in the case of my biological neuron. And then what I get finally as an output is the output, which is some sort of an activation function applied to my activity or the pre-activation function. All right. So this is the connection or how it is basically working with the biology to make it still a slightly more uh, 
clear. We can just see it in this form that the inputs are X, which are of dimensions D. Weights are some, again, W, which is of the same dimensions here as the input. And they correspond to dendrites in the biological world. Uh, then we have activity, which is the weighted sum of inputs, which is equivalent to the action potential in biological neurons. And then we have the activation function, which is uh, the heaviside function in the initial model proposed by my clutch pits. And this heaviside function is behaving again like the threshold function of our biological neurons, where they fire once a particular uh, threshold potential is reached, otherwise neurons do not fire. And this, as I told you earlier, this was a basic model proposed by McLeod Fix in 1946. We have come a lot way, uh, with a long way, starting from 1946. Here you can see different uh, neural networks and their sizes plotted on the y-axis and when they were come when they were basically proposed. And here you can see uh, on the right hand side some of the uh, num size in, of the neural network of biological beings, like humans have ten to the power eleven and so on. All right. So you can see that right now the convergence of uh, Artificial neurons is somewhere between 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 7, and we have about 10 to the power 11 neurons, right? And uh, the idea is basically when we are adding different and different layers, we are increasing the number of neurons, and we can just combine many of these neurons, and uh, they can learn by using a backpropagation network or backpropagation algorithm, and we can have them either as a feed-forward network or as a recurrent network. Right now, we are focusing on the feed-forward network. Recurrent, you will be doing probably uh, uh, later on in some other session. So this is the whole idea behind the multilayered perceptrons. So now the question is the training part. So that is what is taken care of by backpropagation. So uh, we will now take backpropagation slightly in more details. We will see how we can do the forward and the reverse mode of backpropagation using Jacobian products. And we will talk about the computational graphs. Now, uh, backpropagation is basically used to compute the gradient of a lo loss function when it is applied to the output of the network. So, and uh, uh, with respect to obviously the parameters in each layer. So, let us say we consider a simple chain of, uh, you know, start layers as we have in the MLP, as you can see in this diagram given here. So, I start with some input X, which co comes to the first layer, F1, then next layer, uh, F2, then F3, then F4, and then finally my output. All right, so my output is some function x, f of input x. And since f is a comp uh, basically consisting of multiple functions, so it is a composition of functions f4, f3, f2, and f1. And I can represent it in this manner. The forward propagation of signals happens. x comes, it goes to f1, which gives me the output x2. This x2 goes as input to F2, which gives me the output X3. This goes as input to X uh, next layer, which gives me the output X4. And then finally, my output comes from function four, which is taking as input X4. So this is how the forward propagation of signals takes place through this particular model, right? Now let us see uh, uh, what happens next. So we want to compute the uh, derivative. So we start up with the Jacobian. So we take up the uh, Jacobian, I mean, that is we find out the derivative of the output with respect to the input. And for doing this, we will make use of the chain rule. So if I come to the chain rule, uh, since I want to find out dou O by dou X, so I first differentiated with respect to X4, then I know X4 with respect to X3 because I have that relationship F there. Again, I know X3 with respect to X2 and X2 with respect to X and so on. All right. So this is how we can do it. I can expand it, replacing each one of them where their respective functions. And so O is F4, X4. Uh, X4 is F3, X3. X3 is F2, X2. And X2 was F1 into input X. All right, so taking this, this is what we get. Then individual, each of these partial derivatives are the Jacobians for X4, Jacobians of function three for X3, Jacobian for function two for X2, Jacobian for function one for X, right? So now the question arises, how do I compute individual Jacobian for a function F? So for doing that, uh, let us see. So basically my 
uh, GFX is uh, basically DFX by DX. So I can elaborate it in terms of a matrix. So this is what we get. And if you see, it is basically a, a gradient of the function itself. All right. And I can use it either uh, column wise or uh, uh, row wise. Okay. So uh, this is basically, if you can see, it is the row. Uh, means like if I take up delta fi and uh, with x transpose, then it is basically the ith row where i is varying from 1 to n. And if I take it as do f by do x j, where it, j -th, it is a jth column, then it is for j equal to 1 to n. So I can do it either row wise or I can do it either column wise. So we can extract it. If I want to extract the Jacobian from the row, then I will make use of the vector Jacobian product. And if I want to extract the Jacobian using uh, from jth column, then I will make use of J Jacobian vector products. All right. So uh, basically, what basically happens is that we will be making computations and either we'll be doing n, n, uh, Jacobian vector products or M vector Jacobian products. All right. So these are the computations that we will need to do. So now depending upon what is the value of N and M, uh, we can choose if, if it is, if N is greater than uh, M or if N is less than M, what to do. So obviously it makes uh, sense that if N is less than M, then we do a forward mode differentiation as you can see here. So this is how we take it up. We, uh, take up JF4, then JF3, and this, and we do a forward mode propagation here. And in the case it is uh, N is greater than N, then we do a reverse mode propagation here. So what is happening in this case is you are uh, basically calculating uh, column wise or row wise. All right. And to uh, see with why the two are computationally more, uh, it's like why forward mode or reverse mode have a different computational things. I have uh, included a link out here of a math exchange discussion, uh, which uh, can ex which explains it in very nice form that why this particular thing happens. Okay, so uh, now coming to the multilayered perceptron. Uh, now, if you are talking about the multi-layered perceptron and if my output is scalar, then uh, since the output is scalar, it makes sense that we take a use of reverse mode differentiation. So we start up with the loss function, right? And you can see that here I've taken a L2 loss for a uh, my multi-layered perceptron, which has only one hidden layer. So if I take the feed forward model again, the same uh, way that we had decided earlier. So I have F4, F3, F2, and F1. All right, and uh, here I have more than one layers, as you can see. So this is my L, which is given by X4 minus Y square. So this is basically mean square error that I'm calculating out here, right? So uh, this is the uh, loss function that we have taken up and we have taken a feed forward model. So if I want to find the uh, back propagation, that is, I want to do the uh, gradient of this, so that I can solve it out, I need to again use the chain rule. So I will have to find, if I have to find dou L by dou three, so it will be using uh, the chain rule, dou L by dou X4, dou X4 by dou uh, theta three and so on, right? And uh, then you can have similarly dou L by dou theta two and by theta one and so on. So for all the layers, you can find it out. And here basically, this is a DK dimensional gradient row vector and the DK is the number of parameters in that particular layer, right? So uh, this is how we can do it and representing it in terms of algorithm is we start up with input for each X, we first calculate the forward pass that is find out the output. And then we do a backward pass that is we first take it up as uh, UK as one. And then for each one of them, we individually calculate the uh, find the Jacobian for uh, this particular uh, row and then go on doing it up. All right. So this is a uh, algorithm that is based used by this thing. So what basically happens is now that we have, uh, you know, done this particular part, the question uh, arises that how do we compute the vector Jacobian product of all the supported layers? All right. And that is uh, needed because obviously it depends upon the form of the function of each layer. So it depends upon that individual layer. So we will just see how we can do that depending upon different loss functions 
and proceed with that. So let us uh, first take up when we have a cross entropy layer. So if I have a cross entropy layer, let us say out here. So my output is basically cross entropy with log x, y, x. And uh, it is basically given by this particular expression, right? And uh, here my y is the true distribution over labels and my p is the predicted class probabilities. So now if I want to compute the Jacobian, what I will do is I will assume, uh, Ms. Letters, for making it simpler, we assume that the target label is some particular class C. So in that particular case, my Z becomes Fx minus log Pc, all right, which is basically this expression. If I have substituted the value of Pc out here, I can write it as minus log, means I've just substituted the value of Pc and then I've just, uh, uh, you know, applied the log the, and the uh, change the uh, means log a uh, log of a upon b log a minus log b and apply that log of exponential exc same as x c and then there is a minus sign it so it gets changed all right so this is what is uh, happening out here this is a simpler thing and now i can take its derivative that is i can find out dou z by dou x i and here again, if I apply it to both of these sides, then the first term has a summation over J of EXJ and this is XC, right? So uh, if you see it out here, the first term is basically exactly same as the PI, where the predicted class probability is PI minus the second term will have a component one only when i is equal to c, otherwise it will have no component at all, right? So this is what you can get. And this, you can generalize it as that the Jacobian is, that is dou j by dou x is p minus y transpose for the whole thing, all right? So this is with respect to the input. So this is how we can compute the Jacobian in the case I have a cross entropy layer. Similarly, if I have a layer where I have an element-wise nonlinearity, as you can, uh, say in the case of let us say the ReLU activation function all right so in the uh, so for example if i take it up here uh, i have fx where i have phi x and this has z i equal to phi x i for each individual uh, neuron so i will have uh, uh, element wise nonlinearity so do z i by do x j will be phi x when i is equal to j otherwise it is zero and as a result my jacobian will be just the diagonal elements of phi dash all right. And in this case, we can compute the Jacobian by, uh, uh, by basically uh, doing the element wise multiplication of the diagonal elements of Jacobian with respect to with u. Right. Uh, similarly, if I have a linear layer now, then uh, the z is given by simply weight into x. All right. And then if I have to compute the Jacobian, that is, I'm again calculating dou z by dou x. So my z is given by summation over weights. Uh, of xk, uh, wik into xk. So if I take up dou z i by dou x j, it becomes uh, applying it here. And uh, since wik is independent of xj, it comes out. It goes uh, the dou becomes comes on xk. So this is as good as wij. All right. So the Jacobian is basically the weight matrix w in the case of a linear layer. And here I've made use of the uh, Think that do xj by do xk is nothing but identity when k is equal to j. So it becomes one when k is equal to j, otherwise it has zero values. All right. And uh, this is basically your uh, ij point for the Jacobian. And this is what you get the Jacobian with respect to input. And as a result, the uh, uh, vector Jacobian product between ut and j will be ut do j by do x, that is simply ut into. W. So for any arbitrary vector u, you will have it ut by w, u transpose by w. Then uh, we can we basically require it also with respect to weight, not just with respect to the input parameters, which is slightly more complex. So we will take up a, a single example where I have, uh, 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 I will take up the example in which we are taking the gradient only with respect to the single uh, weight wij. So I have ZK defined in the same manner for a linear layer. So if I take dou ZK by dou WIJ, 
again applying the derivative x becomes independent of the derivative of wij so that moves out i have only this particular term and therefore now the identity matrix will have two components it will be having value one only when i is equal to k and j is equal to l otherwise it will be zero and as a result you can see this is the result that you will be getting out here it has only one non-zero entry at location i otherwise it is all zeros all right so this is my uh, Jacobian with respect to weight for a linear layer. And then we can definitely get the vec uh, vector Jacobian product by multiplying it by ut. And this is what you get. That is just the x rates, right? And so the result is basically u into x transpose, which gives you the final values. Okay, so uh, what we have just seen is how we can compute the Jacobian and how we can go forward with it. Now the question arises, uh, like, uh, what is the use of going through that? So basically, it helps us in the computational graphs. So, uh, uh, like, uh, we can use the whole idea to make up computational graphs and then uh, these components can be used to calculate these derivatives in a fast and efficient manner. All right. So, uh, like, for example, if I talk about the multilayered perceptron, the structure is comparatively much simpler and you can always write down the, you know, uh, the back propagation. You can actually hard code the back, back propagation for a multilayered perceptron. But if you come to CNN or, uh, for example, recurrent neural networks, it becomes comparatively much more difficult because the way the differential components are connected with each other, it becomes much and much more complex. All right. So uh, what we do out here is we represent the whole structure as a directed acyclic graph where each node is a differentiable function of all its input. So, for example, here you can see this particular graph uh, in the below part. This is a direct, uh, directed acyclic graph where each of the node is basically uh, depend uh, means we are showing what its input are and each node uh, it, it is basically a differentiable function for all its inputs. So and this is the relationship that we are considering the function that we are considering. So you can see how we have broken it out to make this particular uh, uh, computational graph, right? So uh, means this function has been broken out to uh, the x3, x4, x5, x6, and x7, and how they are related with each other to make this particular computational graph. So we will see this computational graph in slightly more details and see how it helps us out. So this graph is now no longer a simple chain as it was in the case of multilayered perceptron. So we will need to some gradients along multiple paths. For example, let us say we talk about x4. So the uh, x4, it is influencing both x5 as well as x7, as you can see here right so that means the derivative at uh, of output with respect to x4 will depend on other parameters not just its itself so as you can see out here the derivative of x4 depends on the derivative of output with respect to x5 as well as derivative of output with respect to x7 and then partial derivative of x5 over partial derivative of x4 and partial derivative of x7 with respect to partial derivative of x4 so now one way is you do each calculation again but there is no need to do that because you have already calculated the derivative of, uh, you know, uh, if you have already calculated the derivative of uh, output with respect to x5 and for with respect to x7, you can, uh, you know, reduce it. So what we do is we avoid the repeated computations by working in reverse topological order. So how we go about it is that, uh, for example, we will first calculate the derivative of output with respect to x7, which is basically nothing but IM, identity matrix. Then we will calculate the derivative of output with respect to x6. So it is the O by do x7 by uh, the partial derivative of x7 by partial derivative of x6. And then similarly, we get it for x5 and then we get it for x4, right? In general, we can say that we write it down as a, a summation. It's basically do a by dx do xk in summation over do xk by do xj, where there is a summation where k is all the children's of j. So this will give me the uh, derivative of, uh, you know, any particular uh, means uh, derivative of output with respect to any particular input that is within the hidden layers. So here, this particular quantity, the gradient factor, uh, is dou O by dou XK is already computed for higher layers. 
that is for all the uh, child of K. And therefore, this is basically called as the adjoint. This quantity is called as the adjoint and it is already calculated. And we just multiply it by the Jacobian of each child. So it becomes easier. So you are no longer calculating it again and again. All right, so this is uh, how we can use the computational graphs and we can uh, order it in a manner so that it becomes faster. Now, the computational graphs, they can be computed ahead of time. This is what was being done by TensorFlow 1. And uh, uh, what it results is it generates a static graph, and therefore you need to define a session separate and a computational graph separate. All right, and what it does is it makes the model work faster. But at the same time, if you have to change anything within the model, you have to repeat the whole thing and you have to do the whole work again. All the, uh, then uh, other way is that we calculate the graph just in time, which is basically done by the TensorFlow Eagle Mode and TensorFlow 2 plus PyTorch as well as JAX. And in this case, if we are working with a dynamic graph, which whose shape can change depending upon the values it takes by particular function. All right. And this is an example of the computational graph of a multi-led perceptron where in, there is an input X, there is a hidden layer H, and the loss function L is uh, uh, with the L2 uh, regularizer. So you can see out here, this is like represented out in this particular manner, the computational graph is given, okay? And uh, I guess that should uh, help you out with the whole, uh, this particular part. So uh, computational graphs. So what we have done right now is basically seen the Jacobian, the concept of the Jacobian and how it is used to form the computational graphs, which are eventually used to do the back propagation, which is the very important part of all automatic differentiations in these uh, open source deep learning frameworks that we use to build these particular models, right? So uh, like as a, as a means like uh, when you are trying to write down code for implementing a model, main concern remains only to build the model. The automatic differentiation is taken care of by the uh, deep learning framework. So now we come to the final part of it. That is the training the neural networks. And here the major concern is the vanishing and exploding gradients and how we can use to, uh, what we can do to resolve them. So let us uh, start with the training uh, uh, neural networks. So again, as we had discussed that whenever we try to train, it is always good to have a maximum likelihood estimation and that we can do by minimizing the negative log likelihood, which is given by this expression that we had already seen earlier. Now in deep neural networks, the loss is not a convex objective and therefore no, in general, we do not find a global global optimum, but uh, still we do find to get a good solution. And by tuning learning rate, that is a step size, we are able to find up the good solution. The problem that arises is that when we are training deep learning models, our gradient can become either very small, which results in the vanishing gradient problem, or it can become very large, which results in the exploding gradient problem. So this is something which we talked earlier also, and as you can see that since it is dependent upon the derivatives and the derivatives depends upon the activation functions. So activation functions play a very important role uh, even in vanishing and the exploding gradient problem. But the major concern is that the gradient becomes either very small or very large. So let us just uh, understand these, this vanishing and exploding gradient problem slightly in more details. So let us say we consider the gradient of a loss with respect to node at a layer L. And uh, so if I have the loss function L and I try to take it, uh, its derivative, its gradient with respect to some, uh, on some particular layer L. So this is how it will be represented. Here my uh, uh, JL, which is basically the partial derivative of ZL plus one and uh, add by ZL is the Jacobian matrix. And G is basically my gradient at the next layer. All right, so uh, if my JL is constant across layers, then the contribution of the gradient from the final layer GL to any layer L will be basically, since JL is constant, this is getting multiplied. So it will be JL minus one to the layer L and that's it, right? So you can see that this is 
kind of like eigenvectors. So the behavior of the system depends upon the eigenvectors of J. All right. And uh, quoting from the book, uh, although J is a real valued matrix, it is not in general symmetric. So its eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be complex valued with the imaginary components corresponding to oscillatory behavior. So if I have lambda as my spectral radius of J, which is the maximum of the absolute values of the eigenvalues, then if this lambda is greater than one, then the gradient can explode. And if this lambda is less than one, then the gradient can vanish. So this is what gives you rise to, uh, you know, the exploding gradient problem now the uh, or the vanishing gradient problem now if i talk about the exploding gradient problem i can take care of it if i just clip the gradient that is if the gradient becomes greater than a particular value i just clip it so we can some basically do something of this sort and this will take care of my exploding gradient problem vanishing gradient problem is slightly more difficult to resolve so let us see what are the different ways by which we can resolve it so one thing that we can do is we can modify the activation function at each layer so that the gradient does not become too large or too small. This depends on choosing the activation function. So we will again see different activation functions and see how they can affect the gradient. Then we can modify the architecture so that the updates are edited rather than multiplicative. For example, the residual connections. So we will again see how they are helping us. We, will we can also modify the architecture to standardize the activations of each layer so that the distributions of activations over the data set remains constant during training. This is something which you will be learning in the uh, I guess next chap uh, uh, coming chapters and then finally we can choose initial values that is initialization of my weights and biases carefully so this is again something that will be taking care of so let us start up with the first thing that is modifying the activation function so as we had seen in the earlier case if i have an activation function which saturates a uh, saturating activation function results in a gradient which becomes very small, almost zero. And therefore, I do not want a saturating activation function. So the solution is moving towards non-saturating activation function. So we can start up with different non-saturating activation functions. So uh, that is the major idea, right? So why it becomes a problem is, uh, for example, if I take up the sigmoid activation function, which is a saturating activation function, it gets saturated uh, at values between uh, zero and one, right? And this is the expression of the sigmoid activation function. So we can see that in the case I have my weights, which are very initialized to be very large, either positive or very negative, we can just become, you know, it gets saturated very quickly. So how does it affects and why this derivative becomes important is what is being shown out here in this uh, few steps. So the derivative of sigmoid activation function is basically the function itself into one minus function. This is a simple math which you can just try and do it out and you can find that this is simply the function itself into one minus sigma. That is a derivative of my sigmoid activation function. All right. So now if I take up my loss uh, and I do it with respect to X, then what I get is uh, basically the weight transpose into the derivative delta. So it is basically uh, Z minus one minus Z and similarly Z one minus Z here, because in both cases, it depends upon the derivative of the activation function delta, as you can see out here. All right. And which is basically if my output is Z, which depends on sigma, then it is basically Z into one minus Z. So if my Z becomes zero or one, the gradients will be go to zero. All right. So my activation function, that is sigmoid activation function, if it reaches its saturation point, that is zero or one, my gradient, that is dou L by dou X and dou L by dou W, they both will reach zero. So let us see different activation functions and let us see how they are affecting the whole thing. So one thing is, uh, for example, the ReLU. ReLU, as we can we know, gives us the linear output. In the case, my uh, activity is uh, greater than zero. Otherwise, it gives me zero. Now, the gradient of ReLU is basically an identity function because, uh, as you can see, if you take this particular and you take the derivative, this is what you get. And uh, in the case, I have uh, the ReLU as my activation function. Then if I take the derivatives, of uh, loss with respect to uh, x and with respect to the weights, uh, I get the results as wt into transpose of i, that is the gradient of loss with respect to inputs, and otherwise just the identity function with the gradient of loss with respect to weights. The 
as you can see, as long as my Z is positive, the gradient will not vanish. However, there is something that happens in this particular case. In the case we have initialized our weights to be very large and negative, then it is possible that my ReLU has activity which is less than zero. And as a result, that particular neuron never fires. And this gives results to something called as the dead ReLU problem. All right. And a way of dealing with this dead ReLU problem is modifying the ReLU so that there is no uh, such case. So one of the ways of doing this is basically doing a leaky ReLU. So it behaves like the ReLU in the case my activity is uh, greater than uh, zero. But in the case it is less than zero, then it is some uh, multiple, some alpha times multiple of the activity or the pre-activation function. And here in the case my alpha is learned, then it is called as the parametric ReLU. We can also have exponential linear unit, uh, which is LU, or we can also have self-normalizing uh, 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 exponential linear unit. Then uh, there are a large number of uh, activation functions possible. So you can see their mathematical definitions and you can see their range. So you can see that in the case, uh, so here you can see that leaky ReLU, exponential linear ReLU, Swish and GELU, they all are non-saturated activation functions and therefore using them can help us resolving the vanishing gradient problem. Next comes the residual connection. So basically what happens in the residual connections is that I have the input and then it gets added up by a residual block such so that it is the FL is FL dash X is basically FL X plus X. So there is some layer in between and there is a, a connection from the previous layer back to here. So their inner function FL is uh, getting the residual term and plus the input which has to be generated. Okay, and uh, basically the model with this particular residual connection, the number of parameters remains the same, but it has been found that it is easier to train. And uh, the reason is basically that the gradients can then flow directly from output to the earlier layers. So here you can see that, the, I, um, let us see how it is happening. Uh, you can see the activation of the output layer here will be ZL. It will depend upon ZL plus some function summation of the all the residual units that is fi zi theta i right so if i take this particular uh, residual layer so this is the activation of the output layer in terms of any previous layer l so if i calculate the gradient of loss with respect to the parameters of the lth layer then uh, if i take dot l by dot theta l i substitute the uh, uh, components means again i'm doing uh, what you say uh, chain rule so dou l by dou zl and dou zl by dou theta l applying it further so i get uh, dou zl by dou z small l and so on and this is what i get as a, res a result so here you can see in this particular result that the gradient at layer l depends directly on the gradient at layer of capital l that is the output layer and in a in that phase, it is then therefore independent of the depth of the network. So the depth part, which was here, this is where a summation term i equal to one to l comes. This kind of becomes kind of a constant. It doesn't contribute. And therefore it depends only on the first part that is dependent only on the gradient at layer l. So this is how residual connections help us in resolving the vanishing gradient problem. Another way of resolving the vanishing gradient problem is using parameter initialization. So uh, what happens is that my uh, objective function or the loss function for deep neural networks is non-convex. And therefore, uh, the way we are initializing the parameters can also influence a lot of how the particular network will or where the particular network is settled. So there are different initialization schemes, uh, like the one, the first we discuss is the heuristic initialization schemes. And the example that we take is the Xavier or also called as the Glorot uh, initializations. So here what we do is we uh, take the weights so that their variance sigma square is the uh, two upon n in minus n out, where n is the number of neurons in the input and n out is the number of neurons in the output. Let us see how it comes. So suppose we have a linear unit, then my weight, which is dependent upon some distribution and, uh, with mean zero and variance sigma square, uh, standard deviation sigma, 
uh, square. So, uh, and I have input such that its uh, mean is zero and its variance is gamma square. So let us say this is what we have uh, available to us. Then if I want to find out the expectation, the mean of the output. So you can see the mean of the output is simply, uh, you know, if I substitute the value of OI, since it's I'm taking a linear unit, so it becomes WIJ into XJ and uh, they are two independent. So it uh, gets separated. So each one of them, their uh, mean is zero. So this becomes zero. If I take the variance, it is uh, uh, the expectation of OI square. And uh, uh, again, substituting the value of OI, that is WIJ minus XJ uh, out here. So this becomes uh, uh, minus zero, right? And so I have uh, this is uh, uh, given by n, n sigma square gamma square. So you can see these two terms are separable again. So uh, E W I J square is uh, uh, sigma square and E X J square is basically gamma square. So this becomes N in sigma square gamma square. Similarly, I can do it for N out and then I have both the terms N in sigma square and N out sigma square equal to one. Combining the two, I get the relationship here, which is basically nothing but the relationship here that is sigma square is two N in per two N out. We have some modifications of Xavier. We can have Lecune initialization where it is just sigma square by one n in, and we can also have Hay initialization where it is sigma square by two n in. These are nothing but specialized cases of the Xavier initializations. Then we can also have a data driven initialization that is, uh, we initialize our weights based on the data that is the distribution of my inputs itself. Uh, now, the next thing, important thing is we can, uh, how we can basically, uh, you know, speed up the training. So there are two ways of doing that. One thing is we can uh, do model parallelism. That is, we partition the model between machines. So the data remains the same, but uh, my model gets trained in different machines. Or we can have data par parallelism in which uh, my model is, uh, there, but each model is, means the model is same, but it is learning different means each machine has its own copy of model, but it is learning from different data set. All right. So data is distributed or model is distributed. Again, most of the deep learning frameworks, uh, you know, at the present moment, you can just directly use uh, their uh, a scheme of federated learning or parallel learning, both are available and you can basically do both data parallelism as well as model parallelism by just using a single wrapper. So now we come to the, uh, I guess the final part that is regularization and uh, regularization uh, is important in the sense that we need to uh, see that weights do not increase and that way. So there are various ways of doing regularization. It is important to avoid overfitting. So the uh, one way is basically early stopping, which uh, helps us in pro uh, prevent overfitting. So what basically is done in early stopping is that we stop the training the moment my validation error becomes greater than the uh, training error or it stops reducing basically, right? So then I do early stopping. The other way that I can do is using a weight decay so we uh, take up a Gaussian prior for our weights, uh, weights and as well as biases. And then uh, we basically try to encourage in this particular case, the model which have small weights, all right. And uh, um, as a result, what we get is the simple models. Then we can have sparse uh, deep neural networks. So they can also help us in the speed up as well as memory space uh, savings, all right. Or uh, there is another technique which is very much used, that is a dropout technique. In this, what we do is while we are training, we uh, randomly turn off some of the neurons, as you can see in the figure B. So the neurons which are crossed, they do not participate in training at that particular moment or for that particular uh, input. And uh, uh, the neurons are selected randomly with some particular probability P, which is the dropout probability. And as a result, uh, what happens is the other neurons, they are forced to learn what these neurons were doing earlier. All right. And it has been found that this dramatically reduces overfitting. And this is one of the very uh, popularly used regularization method to uh, uh, see it intuitively. What is basically happening is that uh, in this particular case, since I have, uh, you know, uh, uh, removed some of the neurons in between for a particular batch, the other neurons, they have to learn. 
to perform for that particular input. So whatever was missing, they have to learn for that as well. And you can represent it as a noisy, uh, means you can view it as a noisy version of weights where theta ij, where it is basically some noisy part where the probability is one minus p, right? The Bernoulli's noise term. And at the test time, we turn this noise off while for training the noises on. And what we want to do is that in the case when we are, uh, you know, testing, we want to turn off the noise, but at the same time, we want that the weights should have the same expectation at the test time as they've had it during the training. So when we are testing, we just replace our weights by the their value into the expectation of the noise, which is basically one minus P. <coughs> All right. So this takes care of, uh, you know, uh, this takes care of that the weights are same, both while we were training as well as while we were doing, they have the same expectation, basically. All right. So uh, again, you don't uh, really need to do that or implement it by hand unless you are interested. So by defining a dropout layer in deep learning frameworks, you can get the dropout layer directly itself for both training as well as testing part although you can definitely uh, make your own dropout layer then we can also have a way in which we do not uh, turn off dropout while testing all right so even while testing we retain dropout so in this case it behaves like uh, an ensemble of networks because if you go back to the slide then like, you know, this is one network, as you can see, B is one network. If some other neurons were uh, off uh, as compared to this, that will be another network. So I will have basically some ensemble of networks, each with a slightly different sparse graph structure. And this sort of thing is called as a Monte Carlo dropout. All right. And this will mathematically, this has a particular form given by this particular expression. Okay. And uh, finally, we have, we can also have Bayesian neural networks. Now, uh, most of the modern deep neural networks, they are trained using maximum likelihood objective to find a single setting of parameters. And when I have very large models, the number of trainable parameters are much more than the number of data points. All right, and as a result, it is possible that uh, I have multiple, uh, possible models which can fit the same training data, uh, but yet at the same time, they are basically, you know, generalizing in different ways, which you can uh, see that you can have different architectures or even the same architecture, but different initializations, and you can still have different models, which can learn it, right? So in this particular case, how do we capture the uncertainty in the posterior predictive distribution? To do that, what we can do is we can marginalize our parameters by uh, computing the distribution in this manner and then this you can think of as uh, infinite ensemble of differently weight neural networks and by marginalizing out the parameters you avoid the overfitting so this is what we have done the marginalization uh, in this case with the these data and by index have their standard values and so we can avoid overfitting so these are some of the ways by which we can uh, do and uh, for very large neural networks, Bayesian marginalization is very challenging, but at the same time, it has been reported that it can give us significant performance gains. So I guess that is where we end for the now. Uh, I, in the case there are any questions or something, we can take it up. Okay, thank you very much, Amita, for an excellent presentation. Yes, um, it, it was actually quite a long chapter. Uh, you, did, you did a good job of condensing the material. Um, does anybody have any quick questions? We have about um, seven any minutes questions? left. No, okay, then I, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, once again, thank you for presenting, Amita. And um, we'll be back here uh, next week to cover neural networks on images. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, Lucy has a question. How popular oh, okay. is the use of Bayesian neural networks? Okay. Uh, what I would say out here is uh, right now, especially with the limitations of uh, uh, deep neural networks and understanding that it is there is uncertainty, as we have just seen that it may not always converge, Bayesian neural networks have started gaining more popularity. 
so although it was not very popular a year or two year back but uh, for last one year and two year they have become very much popular especially this year if you see many people are working in bayesian neural networks i hope i answered your question thanks okay any anybody else Any other question? And uh, Amit, thank you'll you. Be able to, thank you, be able, You'll be able to send me your Thanks, slides. Thanks, Dinah. I'm not able to hear you, Pierre, in the case you're speaking, oh, um, but it might be a problem at my end. Uh, yes, Dr. Richard, uh, you have some question. I guess Pierre will have to unmute you or otherwise you will have to use the chat. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you. I have a Canadian thank you for a very... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to hear anyone. Is the problem with me? Okay. Can you please speak again? Okay. I, I, <clears throat> it's Dr. Hogan from uh, Ottawa, Canada. I want to thank you very much for a very, very good uh, presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I guess in the case we have no further questions, we can end. Can you hear me now, uh, Rita? Uh, yeah, now I can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, yes, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Amita, for, for an excellent presentation. Thank and, you very um, much. We'll, we'll thank meet you very back much. here uh, next week. So, uh, yeah. have a good day, everybody, or a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.